to when push comes to shove in our lives, what wins out and where where do we land? Is it with Christ or is it with the world? Is it with God or is it with other things that have that have captured our heart? So let's just open in prayer. Father, Lord, we, we come before you and we thank you that today we are able to praise your name today. We're able to gather together as a body and that we can come before your throne. That Lord, your your throne is open to any God who would who would come in the, in the name of Jesus and who would come by the blood of Jesus. May your name be praised today. May your word go forth to all our hearts, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, when push comes to stop, we're going to be reading in Mark cha- chapter 6. Mark's gospel is a little different from all the others. It, it's more direct. It's more about action. It's more about the happenings. This happened immediately. That happened immediately. There's, there's a, the word immediate or immediately happens so many times in the, in the Gospel of Mark. And it's because Mark is trying to get across that when, when, when Jesus came, it wasn't, it wasn't just ideas that occurred. It wasn't just some things that got said. That It was a kingdom of power that came through, through Christ. It was the kingdom of God came when Jesus came. That there, was, there were things that began to occur and it was immediate. That when God came and spoke, it was, it was immediate. There was a change. There, was, there were people that were crippled and people that were sick and people that were living in sin. And when he came and met them, it was an instantaneous change. There was, there was someone lying on the mat and he said, your sins are forgiven. And all of a sudden they're up and they're walking and they're praising God. That this kingdom that Jesus brings is not, it's not later only. Yes, it's later when we get to heaven, but it's now too. There's an instantaneous occurrence. And how much... Because it's now, how much are we supposed to react to him now? And, and so many in the world think, when I'm, before I die, some way, sometime later when I really need God, you know, even, even someone I know, um, I've known all my life, they said, you know, I know that you, you feel that you need, they didn't say this to me, but to someone, I, to someone I know, they said, I know that you feel you need this thing called religion, this thing called God, this thing called Jesus. But... Um, but I just don't need it. I'm just not one of those people. Maybe someday I'll need it. And, and yet the reality to say, what, what it's being said is, I know you need this to make yourself feel better. But, but that's, that's, such a, that's such a delusion because so many people who have known Christ and so many people who have been witnesses of Him have, have gone to their deaths and surf, suffered horrible things because of Him. And they were offered the option of, denying Him, and that everything would be comfortable, everything would be easy for them. But they loved Christ so much that they didn't do that. They, they stuck with Him because they loved Him more than life itself. They loved Him more than comfort. And even as, even as the Revelation says that they loved not their lives, even to the point of death, that they were willing to die for Christ, not just to be comfortable. So, praise God, we're going to look at what God is saying to us here, because there's so many there's so many things through Scripture where where even in even in Mark, you know, you could say, oh, that, well, he's just talking about this is happening and that's happening and just kind of telling the events. But if you look with a deeper, a deeper, more involved look, Christ is giving us examples of people and giving us examples of things not to do and ways not to be, giving us examples of people who who are real. There's many real people who are like Herod, who are like. Herod, who we're going to talk about today, who, who loved, there's a sense of love for God, for, for the things of God, but it wasn't an ultimate love. It was a love in their life. They enjoyed listening to preaching. They enjoyed listening to the truth. They maybe enjoy praying or reading the Bible. But there's other things that they love. When push comes to shove, it's, it's clear that they love those things more. And just the word, when, when push comes to shove, the phrase, because I know we, we can just say these phrases repeatedly and, and, they, and they lose their meaning a lot of times. But I, I, when I began to feel, I, I felt like that was what God was pushing me towards. But then I'm like, what does that actually mean? I mean, I need to like an explanation of that phrase. So it could be interchanged with the phrase, when actually tested. You know, some, someone might appear a certain way, but when actually tested, it's revealed that they're really this way. Or, or something might be told to you, um, something might even be felt by, by you, but, but when you're put through a test, 
it's revealed what's really going on and how strong you really are and what's really in your heart. So, so that's what we're talking about here. When push comes to shove, when the test comes, what does God want and, and, and what is revealed in us? You know, and, and this, this always reveals, when, when push comes to shove, when that test comes, it's always going to reveal what's truly most important in someone's heart. You know, you could have someone who's maybe, maybe got a new job and, and their employer, you know, you ask their employer, how's, how's this employee doing? And, you know, maybe at first he's like, oh, they're doing pretty good. But maybe after a few months or after almost a year, they start to say, you know, this person calls out a lot. And, you know, I know that they know that they like to go party with their friends. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, I know that he says to me that he really loves this job. But when push comes to shove, I, I know that if he has something better going on, he's just going to call out. And so I, I don't think I'm going to go with him anymore. I think we're going to find someone else for the job. So, so when push comes to shove, we're going to see what's really going on in our lives. And, and there are different, all of us here, there are different levels of, of love in our lives. There's things that we all love, right? But there's, they're on a hierarchy. There's priorities that we have made. And maybe we don't even know what all of those are, but they're there. And they have to be examined. They have to be examined. We have to examine what our motives are and what's really driving us, what's really motivating us through our lives. For instance... There's, when you come in, in, into divine order with Christ, he, set, he begins to set things. It's not like you have to go spend a year trying to get your priorities worked out. It's like you have to come to Christ, and if you put him first and seek first the kingdom of God, then he's going to add everything you need in proper order, and he's going to order your life. So there is a divine order that occurs with Christ, but it's not, it's not that we strive to do this on our own strength, like, oh, I better put God first because that's what I need to do. I better put this second because that's what I need to do. When we put Christ first only, He begins to show us where everything else belongs. But when we're in divine order, we might have God first. We would have God first. We'd have maybe our spouse next, maybe our children next, maybe our ministry or ministry itself next, um, just as a, as a thing that we do when we, mini- when we witness the people. Or it doesn't have to be formal ministry. Or maybe our job comes after that. But... But for someone who has not put Christ first, for someone who is not in the Holy Spirit, they might have, maybe, maybe their crack addiction is first in their life. That's the, that's the thing that drives them. But really underneath that, it's, it's lust or it's a selfishness or it's a desire to, to satisfy myself, self-gratification. So maybe after that, you know, they put, they put their friends or they put partying or they put this and that or that first. And then maybe after that, there's their children. And their children are suffering because... They're not in right order with God because their priorities are out of whack. And maybe at, somewhere along the line after that, then, then God is there. And that person could say, well, I go to church, I'm a Christian, I, I believe in God. But, but as we're going to see, that's not always the case. So let's, so let's read our text here. It's, it's Mark chapter 6, verse 16 to 29. But when Herod heard... And, and by the way, this is coming out of the passage where Jesus is asking the disciples, who, who, who do you say that I am? And, and, or who, do, who are people saying that I am? The, many people are saying that, that Jesus is different things. They don't know yet. They're trying to discern who is this man because he doesn't say, he doesn't come out and say, I'm the incarnate God. You know? but, so, verse 16, but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized him and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of, of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. 
And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent, look at that word immediately again, the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So we have this grotesque picture. It's pretty horrible to think that God's prophet, that Jesus said that there's, for, of all the men that have been born ever, there's no one greater than him. He's, a, he's the greatest, under the law, he's the greatest man that's ever lived. So that, that he would be beheaded and his, and his head given to this woman on a platter, who, who is really an evil woman, um, it's so, it's so crazy. It's so corrupt. But, but yet, yeah, God's kingdom is not of this world. And our concern here is really not for John the Baptist because yes, he was killed. Yes, he was um, martyred for Christ. And yes, he didn't deserve to die. It was unjust. It was evil what was done to him. But we don't need to worry about John the Baptist because John the Baptist went right into glory with, with God. He, his soul is, is saved forever. He's, he's with God in glory because he belongs to God. And there's no need to worry about him. Yes, he suffered here, but he's, he experiences glory and joy in heaven. Yes, Her Herod had his kingdom here, but he experiences eternal damnation and punishment and torture in hell. So we have to worry about Herod. Herod's the one that we should feel a sense of sorrow for because there's so many hints in here that Herod, his heart was open at first. And we're going we're gonna to go through this because just because our heart is open, just because our heart is somehow open that God is good, that, that the Word is good, that the things of God are good, does not mean that we're right with God, does not mean that we are going to heaven because it's not necessarily an ultimate love. We could have a love, but it needs to be an ultimate love, greater than every other love that we have. So let's look here. In, in verse 16, now, just so you know, th this Herod is not the Herod that killed all the babies, trying to kill Jesus initially when he was born. Um, this is actually his son who is reigning over Galilee in that area. Um, and, and this man's heart, to be honest with you, seems a lot softer than that first, the first Herod. The, the first Herod seems very cunning and crafty, and he was trying to kill the Messiah. And he even knew that it was the Messiah, and he's trying to kill him. So that's just complete corruption. But, but yet we have this lesser corruption that we see in this man, his, his son, Herod. And yet, just because his heart is softer, he's, 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 he, he falls away completely. So, the pulpit commentary ha has something to say. It says um, that he had put on death he had put to death an innocent and holy man, and it is a high testimony to the worth of the Baptist that under the reproaches of a guilty conscience, Herod should have come to the conclusion that he had risen from the dead, thus probably giving the lie to his own opinions as a Sadducee, and terrified lest the Baptist should now avenge his own murder. I know that's a lot of flowery language. You probably don't understand what he's saying. So, but what he's trying to say is that... Uh, Herod is so convicted when, when we first started this passage he, he's so convicted that he's killed John the Baptist because it says later that he knew he was a righteous man, he knew he was a holy man that this, this is haunting him and, and he's a Sadducee, the Sadducees don't even believe that, that people can be resurrected, they don't believe in the resurrection at all, so um, he's, even, he's even giving up his own beliefs as a Sadducee out of his, out of his guilt ridden conscience because he's killed John the Baptist, he, he's like, maybe the guy's come back to life, and, and maybe he's now going to try to avenge himself on me. Um, but really, in the end, that, that thought process is once again selfish, loving self more than God, not maybe he's res resurrected so I can go and, and repent and change my ways. No, it's maybe he's resurrected and he's going to try to kill me now, and he's a, it's a fear for his own life. So... Going, going forward here, verse 17. 
For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And, and saying to Herod, it is not, and, and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to be put to death. So it says here that for the, for the sake of Herodias, he put him to death. So, so clearly, Herod is not looking at John the Baptist saying, I hate this man. I can't believe he's, he's challenging my marriage. Um, he needs to go down. We're going we're gonna to destroy this guy. He's not, he's not of that mind. Herod is a little more, I think he's even convicted. It says later that, that, it's, it, that he, he knew that John the Baptist was a righteous and holy man. And so if he knew he's a righteous and holy man, and he's telling him, you shouldn't be married to this woman, he must know, he must be convicted and say, you know what? This man, there's something different about this man. He's willing to tell me that I'm wrong. He's willing to, to con confront me about my sin. And I know it's wrong. And, I, and, and there's something about me that respects him for that. So, so there's a sense of, of respect. And even, it, sa it doesn't say that he imprisoned him out of his own heart. It says he imprisoned him for Herodias' sake. Because he's married to this woman who really wants to kill him. And he's like, well, I guess I'll compromise. I guess I'll imprison him, you know, imprison him for a while at least, and make Herodias feel better about the whole situation. But as we're going to find that the thing that, that you are yoked with um, will end up having authority over you and end up owning you. So, so what, what happens is he goes forward and, and, and it says that he feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. It says he, he even defied his wife who wanted to kill the man. It says that he kept him safe in prison. It says that, that he even listened to him in prison. And it says he heard him gladly. He, there was a gladness in his heart when he listened to John the Baptist preach. He enjoyed preaching. He enjoyed the Word. He enjoyed the things of God a little bit. It was something that was maybe fascinating to him. It was something that drew him in. It was something that maybe challenged him and, and he maybe even said, you know what, I feel convicted. I, I really should change. Maybe this, these thoughts were going through his head. There was a sense of openness to God. And But I want you to see here, what I want you to see is that there, is a, there may be a love for the truth, but if it's not an ultimate love, it will not save you, will not save me. It, it has to be a, a complete love of giving ourselves. That's why Jesus said, um, if you love your husband or wife or father or mother or sister or brother or children or anyone more than me, you are not worthy of me. You're not worthy to be my disciple because he needs to be the ultimate love. He needs to be the one that no matter who it is, no matter what it is, if he calls us to give that up or if he calls us to put that aside for a minute so he can speak with us, whatever it is, Man, he has to be the ultimate thing. He has to be the reason we, we live and breathe. He has to be the, the source of our joy. He has to be that, that fountain that we go to. You know, there's, a, there's that song we sometimes sing, the, the, you're, the, you're the fountain I drink from. Um, I forget all the other, other words. But Jesus would be the fountain we drink from. You know, what is the fountain you drink from today as you, as you look at your week and, and your life? It, when you get worn out, and, and when you feel like, I just can't, I, I just need to do something to relax, or I need to do something to just get my mind straight. You know what I'm saying? Is, is there a love, is there a relationship with Christ that, that you can't go a day without just stopping to spend time with Him? That, that, that you really, you know that I've, I've spent like 12 hours without praying or reading my Bible, and I'm starting to get on edge because I feel like my whole life is meaningless, and everything I'm doing, I'm just doing things, but there's, there, that connection with the Lord is not happening. So I need to stop. Even though I have a million things to do, I need to stop and just put Him first, spend some time to reconnect with, with the Lord. So He needs to be the ultimate love. And, and loving preaching and coming to church and agreeing with preaching and feeling convicted and saying, wow, this is awesome. God is speaking to me. That will not save anyone. It has to be a response of the heart that says, God, you're right. I don't want to just stop here and say, you're right. I want to change. I want to agree with my actions that you're right. You know, as James said, love, let, let us not love 
in, um, in word. Let us love in truth and in deed. You know, God, God doesn't look at love as you feel very affectionately about something or you feel very strongly about something. I can feel, someone can even feel very strongly like they want to commit a sin. But if they say, nope, not doing that because I, be, I belong to Jesus Christ and I'm going to serve him, then, then God looks at your actions and he says, you're not loving that sin. You're, you might be drawn to that, but you're rejecting it and you're loving me. So, so he looks at our actions and our actions speak louder than words. You've probably heard it since you were a child from various people. Actions speak louder, louder than words. And I don't mean to say that, that if, you're a, if you're a genuine Christian, everything you're going to do is perfect. But I, I mean to say that there's a, there's a driving force in your life to become more and more perfect like Christ. There's, if you do fall or you do something wrong, it doesn't. Someone, someone in the world might say, well, that wasn't that bad. But even if it's a small thing, it'll, it'll drive you crazy. It'll, it'll, it'll seem horrible to you. And it should seem horrible to you. Not because you're shaming yourself, but because you love him and you don't want to hurt him. So, it's that ultimate love that we need. So, as we begin this, Herod is in, is in a pretty decent state in some level. He, he, there's an openness. There's a response to God, a little bit. There's, you know, this John guy, I, I, I even like to listen to him in, in the prison. I even enjoy hearing him. But, but something in, in Herod's life was wrong because clearly you don't go from there, you don't go from walking right with God to beheading his prophet. That doesn't happen unless you completely fall away and reject him. But, but this was not a complete change. This was a, an opportunity that the devil sees. If you look in verse 21, but an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. So, who was this an opportunity for? Not, not Herod. Herod wasn't trying to do anything. Herodias was trying to do something, and that's definitely, it was definitely an opportunity for her. But even more than her, it was an opportunity for the devil. It was an opportunity for, <coughs> for Satan, who wanted to, he wanted to destroy John the Baptist to behead him and just get that guy out of here because he's too, he's too troublesome. I'm sick of him preaching God's word and, and people repenting and turning to God. He wanted to get rid of John the Baptist. Then he wanted to, he wanted to destroy that little bit of faith that Herod had. He, that weak faith that wasn't even a saving faith, but it was, it was an inkling. It was a drawing toward the word. It was a drawing toward the things of God. It was, a, it was, it was maybe even a hunger for, for something good that might come from, from this man's mouth, that might come from God for him. Satan says, I don't want that getting in my way. And, and it was getting in his way because he had put, he'd put it, Satan had put it in Herodias' heart to completely destroy John the Baptist. And Satan had, had a plan, I'm sure, to destroy him completely, but yet Herod was, it says he was keeping him safe in prison. It says that he was protecting him in prison. So Herod's little slight love for God was getting in, in Satan's way. So he's like, I have to destroy this. So an opportunity for Satan. And if you notice in the word, if you notice in life, Satan is, is full of opportunities to um, tempt us. Satan is always looking for opportunities to tempt. But he, do, he, doesn't do, he doesn't tempt you and I just randomly when we're strong, when, when, we're, when we're feeling like we've got it all together. If we, get, if we get complacent in that state, he might tempt us. But he tempts us when we're weak. He tempts us when we least expect it. He finds an opportune moment. If you look in, you don't have to turn there, but um, if you look in Luke 4.13, 4, 4, it says, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This was when Jesus was being tempted in the, in the wilderness. It says that Satan said, you know what? He's not giving it to me now. I'm going to go away. But I'm going to keep look. I'm going to keep watching him. I'm going to keep looking for an opportune time. And in your in your in my life, we have to come to grips with the fact that Satan does not play fair. That he does not he does not. You know, we can we can say, well, I fell I fell into that temptation, but you know, I was weak and I was I was I was upset and and this happened and and man man, it was just such a bad time for me. But but we have to be ready. We have to be ready at any moment. 
to stand for the Lord. We have to be, be, be ready and, and realize that Satan comes when we least expect it. Satan comes when we are falling asleep spiritually, just for a moment. The Bible says that a little sleep, a little slumber, and poverty comes, comes like an armed bandit upon you. So we, are, we have to be ready and vigilant. But, but Herod was not. Herod, it's like, it's my birthday. I'm going to chill. I'm going to hang out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink with my buddies, all my military commanders and people. We're going to have a good time. Little did he know that through that good time, through that um, little, little just partying with the world, Satan was getting ready to destroy him utterly, spiritually. And, and it's ironic that, that John the Baptist is the one who gets destroyed physically, but yet he's, he's in heaven. There's no need to worry about him. But Herod, the one who thinks he's having a party, <clears throat> who thinks he's living at large, he, th- he thinks he's, he's all right is the one who's really getting destroyed in this passage. So, it says, you know, Satan finds that thing in our lives that is greater loved than Christ. He, he, is a, he is an expert at, he doesn't look at how we feel, he doesn't look at how we, um, what we want to do babe, all the time, he doesn't even know those things. He can't read our minds, but he can read our actions, and he can say, you know what, John the Baptist told this guy that his, uh, his marriage was unlawful, that he shouldn't be with Herodias, and he might not have been as adamant about, about it as Herodias was, but he didn't repent of it. So clearly, maybe he's convicted, but he doesn't love God more than himself yet. And so he saw that thing where he lo- Herod loved himself, loved his own life, loved his, loved his um, pleasures and his power more than, more than Christ. So... What to tempt him with? Of course, <coughs> the devil's going to come along with a temptation of the, the pleasures of the world, the sensuality of the world, all that the world has to offer. It's exactly what he, what he tempted Jesus with. And Jesus wanted to use it for good, so it was a temptation to him. If, he had all, if Jesus had all the kingdoms of the world, he could bring his reign in right now. Wouldn't that be awesome, Jesus? Nope. It has to be done a different way. I have to die so that God can do it. I'm not going to try to seize this myself. I have to die to myself. And that's how God's going to save the world. So, so he tempts him with all the pleasures of the world. It says that there was his nobles, the, the military commanders, the leading men of Israel, all the, all the power and prestige, all the, um, the esteem of men, and all the uh, position, and just the things that, that, that men crave, the power, the success, all of that was represented there. The wealth, this all these men coming into his house. Oh, and on his birthday, no less. Let's choose a day that where it's all about him so that he can love himself. So that he can be ready to um, enjoy those pleasures. So, of course, Satan chose his birthday. Satan chose all the people that represented power and prestige. And then Herod's, Herod's daughter dances. And, and there's something that catches his eye. There's something that catches his eye that is more attractive to him than God. There's something that, there's something that catches his eye, and in an instant, he sees, he sees this woman dancing, and in, in an instant, he, he is willing, he's so ready to just give himself to this thing. He's so ready to just respond to this, this temptation of, of just the, the lust of the eyes. And of course, the devil owns that too. He's going to throw that at him. The lust of the eyes. And, and all of a sudden, he's like a, like a fool. He's just, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Even though he knows that she wants to kill Herod, even though he, she, he should know these things, he says, no, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And in the same way, you know, there's, there's things that come into our lives, and if we're falling into temptation, what we're really saying in that moment, it's, it's just, man, there's, there's eternity, there's God, there's Christ over here, and, and there's this instantaneous, this fleeting, fleeting pleasure that I, that I want, that I'm, that I'm drawn towards, and uh, I'm just... I'll, I'll do whatever you want. And we just run to that pleasure and, and we give ourselves, we, we forsake everything that we thought we wanted over here. And of course, when we repent, if we repent truly, God, God welcomes us back. But what I'm trying to say is that it's, it says in Scripture, don't be, let no one be like um, Esau who was, who was, anyone remember that? Don't, don't let anyone be like Esau 
who, who gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. And it says that, it says that he was world, worldly minded, he was, he was fleshly, he was, he was ready to give up his inheritance just so he could have that fleeting pleasure of the bowl of soup. He's like, I just need to eat right now. Um, and, and I know it's tough. It's tough to deny yourself for Christ. It's tough to deny ourselves for the Lord. But I want you to see that where there's, where there's something higher than God, Satan will use that to capture us. And so we have to make sure that there is nothing. We have to make sure that we are in right standing, divine order with God. So, he says, whatever you ask me, I'll give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I'll give it to you, even up to half my kingdom. And she went out and, and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And, he, and she came in with haste, asked him, and it says that he was exceedingly sorry. Isn't that really interesting? That Herod, even up to this point, Herod is exceedingly sorry. There's a, such a war within this man where he could just be at ease and just say, sure, I don't care, I'm having fun. No, I don't have to die. Well, sure, let him die. But Herod had some measure of a heart. Herod was somehow a little bit responsive to the drawing of God. And he, there's a sorrow that came into his heart. He's like, no. No, not John the Baptist. I don't want to kill this man. He's a, he's a holy and righteous man. It says he knew that he was holy and righteous. And I believe that probably the second to last thing that John wanted, the second to last thing that Herod wanted to do was behead John the Baptist. But it wasn't the last thing he wanted to do. And in a sense, in our lives, we can be like Herod if the, 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 the second to most important thing to us is God. But in our, in our lives, in the way we, we live, and the choices we make, man, it's just not, it's just not number one. It's number two. It's, it's almost there, but not quite. It's, it's not ultimate. It's not the most important thing to us. And so the, the, the second to last thing he wanted to do was kill, kill Herod. He loved this guy. He loved listening to him. He knew he was from God. He knew he'd be doing something sinful and wrong if he killed this man. But he says, it says, because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. So, because of his image before his guests, because he did not want to seem like he was afraid to kill this man, because he didn't want to go back on his oath and ruin his image in front of these people, he said, sure, go and behead the man. Um, and so, it's just it's a sad story. It really is. Um, not for John the Baptist, because John the Baptist is in glory. But for Herod, it's a sad story. But it's what happens when, when there's a love for God, but it's not the love of our lives. You know, I'm just going to go back to this man uh, from, the, from the Gospels who, who talked to Jesus. He was a rich young ruler. And and he came, he came to Jesus, and it says that he, he was really seeking to be saved. He was really seeking after the kingdom. He was really seeking after God. And he, he wanted to know, he was like, what do, I need to be, do I, what do I need to do to be saved? Because I've lived, the, I've lived by the commandments my whole life. I've followed God. I've, I've obeyed his commandments. Man, I've kept, you know, G, you know Jesus says, honor your father and mother, uh, worship God, follow, follow the Ten Commandments. All, everything I said, do not murder, do not kill, do not commit adultery, all, all these things. I just said murder and kill twice. But um, do, not, do not steal all these things that I've said. Just don't do those things. You'll, you'll, you'll have life. And he says, well, I've, I've kept those from when I was a kid. And Jesus says, all right, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. There's just that one thing. One thing that is standing between you and God. Yes, I know, rich young ruler, that you love God. He's second in your life. But the one thing that is more important is your possessions. So I want you to go and sell everything you have, and I want you to give the money to the poor and, and come follow me. It's, it's going to be a life of joy. It's going to be a life of submission and surrender. It's going to be a life of things you would never expect. It's, you're going to see people raised from the dead. You're going to see you're going to see the hungry fed. You're going to see the poor receive good news. You're going to see um, you're going to see my kingdom come in power. You're going to see me resurrect from the dead, and someday you're going to see the power of God through the Holy Spirit come upon you and empower you to go forth into the world and preach the message of the gospel, you're going to see your, even my power through you healing people, because that's what happened after the day of Pentecost. 
the power of God was coming through the disciples, healing people, raising people from the dead, all of this. You're going to see all this happen. It's, it's going to be an adventure. It's going to be suffering. You might die, but it's okay. You're going to be with me in glory if you do this. But you have to give up your possessions. And it says that the rich young ruler went away sad. He was exceedingly sorrowful, like Herod. He went away sad. He didn't go away, you know what? I hear what you're saying, Jesus, but I think my possessions are more important, so I'm going to go. That's all right. You can have all that. No, he, he went sad because he did have a love for God. He did have a love for the things of God. He really wanted to follow God. He left sad because he was torn, because there was something else that had his heart. He went sad because he was still conflicted and just not ready. His possessions were possessing him. And, and just like we said, you know, we look at, just like I said earlier, if the thing that you are yoked with is going to own you. It's going to determine where you go. You know, like Sherry shared about the yokes, the yokes on you, her, her message weeks ago was, um, you know, it's just talking about the, the, the cows with the yoke. And, you know, you're yoked with that animal and wherever it goes, you have to go. You have to work as a team. You have to go together. So if you're, if you're yoked with Herodias and she's trying to kill John the Baptist, I mean, you can fight for a while, and you can have a resistance in your heart and say, you know, no, I'm going to protect him in jail. You know, it's like, I'm not going to kill him. I'll just, I'll just imprison him. I'll protect him in jail, though, and I'll enjoy listening to his preaching. And all of a sudden, you find that you're at your birthday party, and, and there's all the officials and everyone that you want to impress. And she asks for the head of John the Baptist, and all of a sudden, you're in a pickle because the two things that you love more than God are your, your, your esteem, your pride, your, and... and um, your wife, which you won't give up for God. So, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sick. I've been sick all week. Um, so if we, if we don't let go of those things, and if we don't respond, we'll be like Herod. Um, let's just move forward here. Um, it, it says he was exceedingly sorrowful, but... I don't believe that he was just exceedingly sorrowful because, um, because there was something in him that really, that really wanted him to die. There was something real in him that really wanted to get a promotion or whatever. I mean, he's already, he's already ruling over Galilee. But what it was is there was a fear of man in his life. There was a fear of the opinions of other people. There was a fear of what other people are going to think of me. And, and there's another person that we know from, from Scripture. If we look back in <coughs> 1 Samuel, um, chapter, I believe it's chapter 16. It says, I'm going to read a, a, just a, second, a segment from that. It says, Saul, you know King Saul. He was, he was a king who fell away. He's known, famous as the king who um, God chose him, but he fell away. God wanted him to reign. God wanted him to be the chosen king. And he said, no, God, I care more about what people think than what you think. So it says that Saul said to Samuel, this was after he, you know, Samuel had, had told him, this is the word of the Lord. I want you to go and conquer this land. I want you to, to kill all the people and kill all the animals. And don't, don't take anything because this is, you know, this is a war and you're not supposed to be taking spoils for yourself. This is about obeying me. This is what I want you to do. And then he, he kept the king alive and he kept some of the, some of the animals for himself. Um, because he just wanted to get rich off the whole thing. And Samuel goes to him. He says, you know, this is wrong what you've done. You've, you've disobeyed the word of the Lord. And this is, what, this is what Saul says. He says, I have sinned, for I have, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. And then, it sa and then Samuel says, I'm not going back with you. You know, and then... Saul gets all crazy and tries to grab his cloak, and, and, and Samuel's not going back with him, so he keeps going in that direction, and the cloak rips. And then Samuel looks back and says, even today, God has ripped the kingdom from your hand. So he was not turning his back because, because Samuel's heart had not changed. I mean, Saul's heart has not changed. Because later after that, he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. And it's, again, it's, it's dressed up like, I want to go worship God. I want to go bow before the Lord. I want to go 
I want to go worship your God. Let's go worship God together. That's, that's the, the, the context he's trying to say. He's trying to say, this is what I really want to do. You know, I want to, I, I want to worship God. I want to, I want to go with you and, and get things right. But what's really being revealed in his heart, honor me before the elders of my people. He's still concerned about, this is how I want to seem and appear before all my people. I, I care about what the people want. It says, when, when he was first confronted with his sin, he said, the people wanted to keep some of the sheep. It was the people, the people. And it wasn't God, God, God. God, you said this to me. God, this is what I wanted to do. God, this is what you called me to do. So this is what I did. No, it says, it says the people wanted this, so I decided to say, instead of listening to God, I'm going to be liked by the people, and I'm going to do what they want. Um, and, and so if we have that compromising in our hearts, we're going to be led astray. It says that the fear of man is a snare, and, and that certainly tr- pro- proved true in Herod's life. Um, now, I just want to close here by saying that um, if we don't destroy the yoke, it'll destroy us, like we saw with Herod. Uh, but I don't want to leave us feeling like we're, you know, we're doomed to be like Herod, because that's not true. <coughs> You can be like John the Baptist. You can preach the Word of God, not just here, not just in a pulpit or whatever, but you can live by the Word of God. You can follow Him. You can hear His call on your life like John the Baptist did when he was a young child. He heard God driving him, even though everyone in his age was probably, you know, going, just going to school, hanging out with friends, maybe getting ready to marry this person or that person they had their eye on. God, he heard something from God telling him, go out into the wilderness. Go out into the wilderness where there's no one there, nothing for you to do except be with me, and I want to work on you there. And so he's out in the wilderness, and he's eating locusts and honey, and he's, he's living off the land. He's not really living off much of the land, so he was probably really skinny, and he was probably smelled because he's out there with no hygiene products. And, and he's got, he's like got a camel's hair on him, so he probably wasn't too nice to give a hug to. But he was obeying God. He was, he was following God's plan for his life. And he heard something different. You know, some of you might hear, you know, you feel like this is what you're supposed to do to be a Christian. This is what, this is what all Christians do. And this is just kind of a Christian life. It's just kind of like an American life, just with, you know, going to church on Sunday. And this is what's expected of me. And maybe you hear something in your heart saying, I've called you to do this great thing. I've called you. Come over here with me. Do something. Do something that I'm calling you to do over here. And yet, you, you think to yourself, that's just too radical, that's just too crazy. That's just too different than what's going on around me. But if you want to be like John the Baptist, you might want to listen to that voice. And check, of course, that it's in line with the Word, because God's not going to ask you to do anything that's outside of His Word. But you can be like John the Baptist and hear that call and follow, and then someday God, God is, it's time for God to use you, and He begins to raise you up, and you begin to preach to the people, his word, um, and even when, now I'm not saying that all of you are going to be preachers necessarily, or you might be in your workplaces and in your families at different places, but God has called you to, to, to share something, to say something. All of us are called to preach in some way. It's just a matter of how and to whom, right? So what happens with John the Baptist is he's so faithful to God, and he's spent that time alone with God not doing what everyone else does, not spending his time like the rest of the world, but he spent that time with the Lord, and the Lord got him ready so that by the time where he is in prison, by the time where he's about to get his head cut off, he's saying, nope, you can cut my head off, I'm going to go see Jesus. I don't care what you think of what I've said, because what I've said to you is the truth, and if you can't see that I've loved you by giving you the truth, then you can't really see it all. And so... The reality is that, you know, Jesus is, it says that Jesus loved the the rich young ruler. And I don't want you to think that he was just trying to pick on the rich young ruler. I mean, if you do, that would be really crazy if you thought that. But but I don't want you to think that, you know, I don't want you to think that he just sent him away and was like, I don't care, go away. Because the word of God says he loved him. And it says that even as he was walking away from Jesus, he loved him. And like we said earlier, love is not just his feeling doesn't mean, maybe, maybe Jesus felt love at that moment, but that's not what he's trying to say. It says that he loved him because he told him the truth. Because no one in his life 
had ever challenged him. He had lived perfectly by the rules, and he was a rich man. I'm sure everyone is just trying to suck up to him so they, that he would like him and they wouldn't get in trouble. But Jesus has, has the guts and the boldness to say to him, you know what, you love your possessions more than you love God. And that was love. That was love to show him his own reflection. And, and that's what the Word of God does to us. It show, when we read the Word of God, we see our own reflection. We see what we really are um, and what God wants us to be. And, and it's a lifelong walk. It's a lifelong journey. We're not there yet. Um, but, but hey, if he's showing us that next step, we better cut it off. We better go forward. Or else we might end up like Herod, Herod did. And there's other people, not just back then, but there's other people who have given their lives. If anyone remembers, in, in 2015, there was 21 Egyptian Christians were beheaded by radical Muslims in Libya. Um, and those men, I just, I, I found this really interesting because I didn't know a lot of the details about where they were from and what they were doing. And um, it says, I, I just want to read this to you. It says that these young Christians were in their early to mid 20s. They went to Libya in search of work to help feed their families, living under the poverty line in Egypt. These are all poor Christian men from Egypt, my age or younger. In the days and weeks leading up to their deaths, their ISIS captors tortured them and attempted to persuade them to deny Jesus. For, and, and in return, they, they would get to live. Um, and they might even be compensated to live. Um, they might even be helped monetarily. But all refused to deny Christ. They all, denied, they all died on that beach singing songs to Jesus. I find that to be incredible. That, you know, you can, you can <coughs> live your life in such a way that leads there. You can, you can live a life that leads to you dying together with the believers of Christ, faithful people, dying, singing songs to Jesus. Man, I'm, I'm about to see you, God. I don't care what they throw at me. And of course, it's going to be difficult. And even as, even as this one, this one torture of Christians once said to this, this lady, said, why do you always scream when we hit you? Because this man was a slave himself. This, this man was suffering in his own way because he, he was told to um, he was told to whip people for 14 hours a day and, and he had a couple smoke breaks and a couple coffee breaks um, but he was, this was in Romania in, in communist Romania, he was whipping people 14 hours a day and he was such an angry human being and he, and, and he said why do you guys scream when we hit you I'm so tired of hearing screaming and she said well we scream because it hurts <laughs> you numbskull, she didn't say that but, but um, there, there, yeah <laughs> The, the reality, though, is that this man was was a prisoner of his own in his own way. This man was um, suffering in his own way, in his own mind, because he was so given over to anger and hatred and, and and violence. And and yet, this woman was so filled with the love of Jesus Christ, and she lived a life that was just the like he'd never seen before. And she um, she said to him, you know, yeah, we we scream because. Because, because you're hurting us and it hurts. But, but she didn't just leave it there. She, she said, you know what? I want you to know something. This was on, a, this was on one of the smoke breaks. After, after she'd gotten a beating, beating from him and she's just laying there and he's smoking a cigarette, drinking a coffee. She said, I want you to know something. You can, you can beat me. You can even beat the life out of me. But you're never going to beat the, my love for Jesus out of me. And she said... She said, I, and I know that you know that because you've, beat, you've beaten a lot of Christians and you've, you've tortured a lot of Christians who, who love the Lord just as much as I do. So they probably said that to you. But I want you to know something else. You can never beat out of me my love for you either. And, and this man looked at her. I think he actually pistol whipped her and she, and she fell unconscious. Um, but, the, but before she fell unconscious, he was able to take... She was able to explain to him, you know, the reason I love, I love you, the reason I love people, um, is because of my boyfriend. You know, I have, I, I met this man, and he's, he's amazing. I, I have this boyfriend, and, you know, ever since I met this man, you know, he, he loved me so much, but I know I, I was so unworthy of his love, and he loved me so much that no matter how, no matter what I do, no matter who I meet, no matter where I go, I just can't help it. I just love everyone. I just. I just know that everyone needs love and I just give this love to them for free. And 
and um, and that's about when she when she was hit and she fell asleep. <clears throat> and when she woke up hours later, he was sitting there, <clears throat> and she woke up and and the gun was pointed at her face. And the man who told this story, Richard Warrenbrandt, he's he's an amazing um, survivor of of the tortures. Um, and he said this was what this was a this was a testimony he heard that that most described a biblical verse that he had read, and he was amazed to, to hear that it really described this verse. It says that the, vi- the, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Um, that we are, we are to be violent in our seeking of the kingdom. We are to say, I don't care what gets in my way. I'm seeking the kingdom of God. I'm going to seek Christ. And this man who had just heard this testimony from this lady, he said, he, he had the gun pointed at her when, when she woke up, and, and he said, tell me the name of this of this boyfriend of yours, and I want you to introduce me to him, or I'm going to shoot you right now. <laughs> because it's amazing. Because this man, this is, all he knew was violence. All he knew was threatening. And so, but he knows he has this need for Jesus, and he sees that this man, this man has the answers. And what I need in life is, is love. And you know, another thing she had said to him is, you know, why do you always hit? Why do you hit, hit, hit all day? You just you hit people and you hit people. That's all you do. He said, why don't you just kiss? Why don't you hug? Why don't you love? Why don't you? It's so much nicer and it's so much more enjoyable to hug people, to kiss people, to love them. And he said afterwards, he said, you know, that is so true. He said, why do I hit people all the time? I don't enjoy hitting people. I whip people all day and I'm, I'm angry at the end of the day. And he said, you know, what your boyfriend said, he finally knew it was Jesus. He said, what, I, what, what Jesus said, uh, changed my life, and and, and and he got he got radically saved. And so, what, what I want to <coughs> share in all this is that, you know, we can live a radical life for Christ. We don't have to be like Herod, who is just compromised. And, and, and yes, there's a love for God, and we and we come to church, and we hear the word, and we read our Bibles sometimes, and and um, it's like we're looking for something. We know that it's good. We might even read our Bibles with gladness, or listen to preaching with gladness, and it's like. And I'm, I'm glad at what God's saying to me, and this and that. And then, but then we we go back to our lives, and nothing changes because there's other things that we love more. And God is trying to show us through Herod that that's possible. There, that can happen in your life where you where you love God and you want Him, and you and there's a love for His Word, but it's just not a love that's enough, a love that's more than every other love that is going to save you. And, and, and so we can live a life that is. It might be painful at times, but it's going to be full of joy, joy inexpressible, as the word says. Um, And you know, I I don't want you to feel or think that you that you can you have to wait for this for this to happen. This can happen to you today. If you're if you feel like today you say, God, I feel like I'm compromised in some way, you can lay down that thing to God. Whatever it is that that is whatever it is, it's not worth it. It's not it's not worth your attention it's not worth your time man it's, even even if it's someone you love that's a good person if they're getting in the way of you and God it's not worth it um, but you can live like you can live like these young Christians you can live like that lady where where there's just this indestructible love that is ruling your life and no matter what the the devil or men try to throw at you it's like man I just can't, like that lady said, I just can't help but love every single person I come in contact with. Um, so as, as we close in prayer, let's just bring our hearts before God. Father, I give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. I give you praise for being with us today, God, for showing us who you are, for speaking to us from your word. Um, Lord, I, I ask that there would be nothing setting us up for for an opportunity from the devil that might take us down, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would expose the battle plan of the enemy, God. It's so true that, Lord, when we, we can have good intentions, Lord. <clears throat> we have good intentions and we come and we come to your word, we come to church, or or we come before you in prayer and some somehow we sense your presence just touching us and love and showing us your love and we feel indestructible at times, Lord, and we feel there's nothing that can stop this the power of God in my life, and and yet um, Satan laughs at that because there's no strength in us. 
and we have to daily depend on you, moment by moment, to daily take up our cross and follow you. We have to deny ourselves, Lord, that, that we can walk a million miles with you and then one mile falls short, one mile after those million miles. We just, something else catches our eyes like Herodias' daughter, and all of a sudden we're off the path. Lord, Lord, we ask that you help us, keep us, keep us weak, God, um, not 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 in our not weak in spiritual strength, but keep us weak in ourselves so that we can come to you and be strong. Lord, keep us dependent on you, Jesus. Um, Lord, I thank you for feeding us. Thank you for caring for us. And um, I'm just asking God that every single thing um, that would somehow be warring for you in our lives, God, that it would just be brought down low, Lord. It would be discarded today, Lord. It would just be thrown off with disgust to say, oh. That's disgusting. I don't want that. That thing is that thing is an idol. It needs to go back to hell where it came from. Lord, uh, Lord, I just ask for for peace that passes understanding, and and I ask that you keep us vigilant, you keep us in us, and, and keep our hearts in line with you, in love with you, Jesus. And uh, help us to rejoice, Lord, not to not to get all gloomy because of this message, unless unless we want to go away sad like the rich young ruler, but to rejoice and say, praise God that he's given me an opportunity to surrender everything to him. We thank you, Jesus, and we ask that you would bless us as we go. And I just thank you for each one that, that, that came here today. Um, I pray that, that they would just have a special protection from you as we go, that we would uh, be able to glorify you with all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.